Uh, We stand this morning, not out of habit or ritual, but just out of recognition for the authority, the supremacy, and the sufficiency of God's word. I'm going to read John chapter 14, verse 1 through um, 14 this morning. John says this in verse 1 of John 14, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. These are Jesus' words. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. But from now on, you do know him, and you've seen him. And so Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me the words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Verse 12, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. You can have a seat. One of the things that causes me the most anxiety in life are instruction manuals. Um, There's several reasons for that. One is uh, I hate details, and second, um, I'm horrible at putting anything together. I've confessed that if you've been around crossings any time at all, that I'm the least mechanical and least fix-it kind of person that you have ever met in your life. Um, There's just something about my brain. You look at an instruction manual, and then I've got to do everything step by step just blows my mind. Um, but the worst, I'll tell you, the, the absolute worst instruction manual, and probably many of in, you in here have never actually seen it because I've never really seen the whole thing, but that is the IRS tax code. It is, I had to Google this, it is 73,000 pages. Can you imagine that, what it would look like? I mean, some of you, maybe if you're avid readers, maybe you've read this epic novel that was 1,000 pages long, right? you got this book that's this thick, 73,000 pages. Can you imagine what that would be like if, I, if any of you in here are CPAs? I have the most respect for you to navigate those waters because I tell you what I feel like, and I don't want to sound like, I don't know if the IRS will ever somehow in all their weird internet algorithms get a hold of this message, but I want to say I'm not an anti-tax guy. I pay my taxes just like everybody else. But that tax code, I feel like everything you look up, the, the, the message is the same. You're going to jail. Everything, no matter what you're searching for, the answer is the same. You're going to jail. No matter what, every page, and and sometimes it's not only with my personal taxes, they're fairly simple, but as I'm communicating, even to our accountant that helps us as a church, and how do we handle this situation? How do we handle that situation? I feel like it's a constant trap, and, and, and with everything that I'm searching for, I feel like I'm just going to jail with whatever I find and whatever the answer is I think it might be. I'll be honest with you, and in Christianity, sometimes I get there too. I get to a place where the Word of God feels like a book, then no matter where I'm looking and where I'm reading, I feel like I'm not doing anything good enough. It's almost like we could say, now I know theologically this isn't true, right? I know once we place our faith in Jesus and we're rescued in him by his grace alone, we are held in his hand and nothing can ever take us out. But I'm just confessing to you that sometimes I find myself in a place where I'm reading his word and I, and I, and I feel like I'm not doing things good enough. I feel like maybe I'm not going to go to jail like I am with the IRS tax code, but, but, but maybe I'm not good enough to be in his presence. I feel like I've failed with what I read. And I confess that to, to you guys as someone who has... A, 
two advanced degrees, right? I mean, I've got a master's and a doctorate degree all in this whole Bible kind of subject matter. Uh, If anybody should understand this book, right, it's somebody like me, but I'm telling you, I still find myself sometimes trapped in this place of Christianity where I feel like nothing I can do is good enough, and as I look at this book, I find myself falling into a default setting of just like I'm not measuring up. I don't think, matter of fact, I know that this, that wasn't the Christianity that the disciples were invited to. That wasn't the kind of Christianity that the disciples who followed Jesus were a part of. You see, if you've ever been on a retreat before, maybe especially those of you who grew up around the church and you did kind of the youth camp thing, maybe even a mission trip that you did, and, and you felt this emotion or a reality that as you were there, your, your Christianity felt easier. It's like you're there and you're, you're surrounded by, if you went to, i just give you a match world, I, I went to... Uh, camp, youth camp nearly every year, and here was our schedule. Some of you probably did something very similar. You wake up in the morning, and you had to have some kind of real catchy, yet a little cheesy way to describe spending time with Jesus. Ours was tog time, time alone with God. So every morning, that was the first thing on the schedule. Schedule. You had your tog time, spent time alone with God, and then you went, you ate breakfast, and then you played these games, which were ridiculous, right? They were the idea behind these games that you played was anybody who could play any normal sport couldn't be good at the games uh, that that you played at church camp. I think they did that on intentional, but you play these games, and some hollers Bible verses and everything mixed into it, and at night you hear that phenomenal speaker who gets everybody just geared up one step at a time to that final night where everybody's in tears or everybody's burning their CDs, that's my generation, of non-Christian music. And that's the rhythm of how it goes. And so you get in that atmosphere of a camp retreat or maybe mission trip or service project, and it's easier because you're amidst this Jesus culture. You're kind of surrounded by it. You're immersed in this Jesus culture. That was the life that the disciples were living When Jesus came to him and he said, and we're going to look at this in a couple weeks as we continue in this series, and he says, come follow me. Come follow me. His invitation to them was to stop right where they were, not that they had to prepare themselves or do anything to get good enough or be right enough, but right amidst the life where they were living at that moment that they would just come, take a step forward, and walk with Messiah Jesus. Come and follow me. And so their lives at that point, were immersed in Jesus. It was a Jesus culture. They traveled with him. They ate with him. They lived with him. Everything was Jesus. And so as we get to John chapter 13 and the very end of 13, let me read these words to you. These are the words immediately before what we read in chapter 14, 13 verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? So they're coming to this realization that things are changing for them. Where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now. But you will follow me afterward. So Jesus has broke the news to the disciples. This Jesus culture that you've been living in, this to us, maybe this ultimate camp or retreat kind of immersed environment of Christianity where every aspect of daily life, they were walking with him, they were talking with him, and they were eating with him. It's all about to end. So you can imagine the way that the disciples are feeling. That was the only Christianity they knew. Everything that they knew was about to be turned upside down, and Jesus says, I'm leaving. And so, of course, when we get to chapter 14, And we see Thomas and Philip begin to ask these questions. And we see in verse 1, let not your hearts be troubled. Well, that's what he's speaking to. Let not your hearts be troubled. You don't need to have all this fear and anxiety as I leave. I've got a plan for you. And so what Jesus is doing over these words is he's, he's sharing a plan. He's sharing a provision with them of really what it's going to mean to be a disciple, a follower of the way, even though Messiah Jesus is departing. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. There's a couple different images that would have come to mind for the disciples. 
The, the first and most obvious would be that families there in the ancient Near Eastern culture, they would live multi-generationally within the same dwelling place. And so the son would get married with his family and live with the father, oftentimes then with the grandfather. And so you have these family compounds of multiple dwelling places sometimes for those that had the funds. Others would, might be all within the same dwelling place. And so as we read this language and Jesus is communicating to them, my father's house has many rooms. He's speaking to something that they would have understood, that the family, the true family, they come and they live together and they dwell together. But there's something else that I think would have been in their minds as well. And, and that's this picture of these beautiful Greco-Roman dwelling places. They were beautiful places of multiple buildings, terraces, water, a beautiful compound there where people lived together. My father's house, it has many rooms, and what he wants them to hear is that there's room for you. There's room for you. He says, if it, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. You see the picture that he's painting for them is this isn't a hotel. This isn't a place where you can come in and you can just stay a little while, but then your reservation will time out and then you've got to leave. It's not a temporary vacation setting, but this is his father's house. This is where you come and you dwell and you stay. Also in this picture, it's such a beautiful metaphor and illustration of so many different aspects throughout scripture, but he, he's also drawing back this Edenic picture of the garden. That, that, that's where the father dwells. If you remember back to Genesis chapter one, God himself walked there in his house amidst the garden of Eden alongside of Adam where there was no fear or shame. And so Jesus is saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you. There's room for you in my father's house where he dwells. And you will come and you will stay there and live there forever. Where I am, you may be also. He's going to make a way. He's going to make a way. And you know the way where I'm going. This is one of those moments. There are many in the Gospels that I think, um, I'm going blank on his name, but the Star Wars writer found some of the inspiration for Yoda in Jesus' words. Because I think many times the disciples are there and he says something and they're like, what in the world did he just say? And I think this is one of the moments and we see Thomas respond to that here. He says, where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas says, um, Lord, we do not know where you are going. We've got no idea what you're talking about is what he's saying. We don't know. We want to be there. You can hear it in Thomas's voice. You can hear the desire for, for, um, for more answers, for more information, for more confidence in Philip's question that comes later. But Thomas says to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And he desires it. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way. There are, there are so many things as Jesus shares this idea with Thomas and the disciples that would have been around him. We are blessed to have, by God's sovereign provision, John's gospel here. And the reason we have the names is John was there as well. He's writing this, and he's hearing this, and he was, he was there, so he can tell us exactly what's going on. And so Jesus says, I am the way. This is the sixth I am statement in John's gospel. Well, there's so many things that are significant about the I am statements, but I want to read to you in Exodus. Maybe the, maybe the foundational the foundational inspiration, reasoning behind Jesus being the I am as the Father reveals himself as the I am in Exodus chapter 3. So I'm reading beginning in verse 13. You don't have to flip there. I'll just read a couple verses to you real quick. 
Moses is having this conversation with God and he's kind of confessed his insecurities about what God's called him to do to free the people. And he says, Moses says to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. I am who I am. Those words is where we get the name Yahweh. It's the name that the Jews don't speak of. It's the name that literally translated, I am the I am. I am everything. There is nothing outside of me. I am everything. I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, the I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. And so when Jesus says, I am, again, for the sixth time, he's saying, I am with the Father. I am part of the I am, the ultimate I am. And I am the way. I am the path. I am the journey. I love the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases it, and he paraphrases Thomas's question with, I don't know the road, and Jesus answers with, I am the road. It's just like you and I so many times in life, we have a question and we look ahead to a destination, right? How do I solve this problem? How do I fix this? Well, we look ahead to a destination and say, when I get there, I'll fix the problem. That's what the disciples wanted to know. I can't find where you are going on my GPS here. How do I get to the coordinates to get there? And Jesus says, no, no, I'm not about the destination. I'm the journey of you getting there. I'm the journey. I'm the process. I'm the day-to-day. I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is where the exclusivity and the intolerance of Christianity come from. Now, I say that not to say that it's the way that many in our culture at large view it. It's not, about, it's not about us and them, us versus them, or us speaking differently or hating the sinner. It's not that at all, but it's the exclusivity of Jesus saying, I am the way, not a way. I am the truth, not one of the truths. And I am the life. It's the exclusivity of Jesus being the only way to an eternal, hopeful life with the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father. From now on, you do know him. And you've seen him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I think maybe as we rephrase and rethink the Christianity that's being discussed here, I want to give you a sentence, a thought here, maybe on a a new way or a different way. If you, like me, find yourself in a place where you see and you see this as some another IRS tax code that you approach and you find yourself constantly struggling with failure, I don't think that's what Jesus invited the disciples to, nor do I believe that that was the invitation given to you and I when Jesus says, come follow me, but rather it's to a Christianity, a Christianity which is a journey of increasing joy as we immerse ourselves in Jesus. A Christianity of increasing joy. You see, Thomas, as he's asking these questions, he thought that he had lived in the golden era of Christianity. Even many of us, we look back, we look back at at the disciples and we read the amazing stories that that not only in the Gospels, through the book of Acts, and we see this golden era of Christianity, and that couldn't be farther from what the Bible describes. You see, in John chapter 16, just one page later, you flip, and it's in this same explosion of red in your New Testament, you see that Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I leave. That means it's going to get better for you. You think it's been great in this this walk with me, this talk with me culture that the disciples lived in. Well, it's going to get better as I leave. It's to your advantage that I go. And that blew their minds. You see, the golden era of Christianity wasn't the disciples. The golden era of Christianity will always be today. It will always be 
today because Christianity is this journey of ever-increasing joy. The more we, the more we know him, we, we just looked last week at the picture in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, us being transformed from one degree of glory to another. That's this constant journey of growing in joy as we grow in him. Of course, the way that Peter writes, that you have not seen him talking about Jesus, but you know him and you believe in him and you rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible. That's for you and I today. That didn't finish when the disciples died or it didn't finish when Jesus ascended. That is the gospel invitation that's been given to every one of us here. Christianity is an ever-increasing joy as we immerse ourselves in Jesus. You see, there's two kinds of people, largely, I think, in the world, and all of us know and realize that we should exercise, right? That's not a new truth. All of us know we should exercise, but there's two kinds of people. There's those who enjoy exercising, and there's those who enjoy having exercised, right? Some people hate the process, but they enjoy saying that they did it. I, I, my hypothesis is that's the majority of you in here. I'm one of those freaks. I like enjoy the process in there. And I know I think that play makes me the minority. My son had, uh, they started back their soccer this week. And as they start back, this is kind of a big age jump for him and going back to a little bit more of a serious play for his age group. And so they come back to the beginning of the season and the coach just wants to gas them completely. He, they come back from summer. Many of them didn't do anything at all all summer. And the full practices all last week were nothing but sprints and running. Sprints and running. That was the hardest workout my son has ever had, both days. He gets in the car afterwards, and he's talking about, oh, you know, this hurts, and that hurts, and my stomach doesn't feel good, and he's talking about all these things, but then the conversation transitions, and he said, but, you know, I kind of did like it, and he began talking about how he's proud of himself. He enjoyed having finished, but he didn't enjoy any bit of the process of doing it. You see, oftentimes in Christianity, we live this life where our only hope in life is that we might accomplish something good. Our only hope, and so we live a life void of the joy of the gospel as we're walking through this journey of just hoping we can get something accomplished, but that couldn't be any more opposite of what Jesus' invitation here is to the disciples and to you and I. He says, I am the way, I am the journey. Rather, you find your constant and unending hope in me as you journey through every single day of your life. It's not about the accomplishment. It's not about the end result. It's not about being good enough. Your hope is in Jesus here now and with me today. Amidst the struggle, amidst the victory, Jesus came and he lived. He lived a sinless life, a perfect life. He came from the right hand of the Father down and he lived and then he died the worst death imaginable, death on the cross. But it was the only possible way to rescue you and I out of our sinfulness and out of our wickedness because of that separation, a completely holy and righteous, sinless, perfect God, and yet he desired a relationship with us, so there's something that had to happen. Someone had to pay the price for sin, and so he sent his only son to come and die and pay that price so that you and I could live a life in a relationship with him. He rose again three days later, which all of this is death on the cross, three days after what we're reading this morning, and John chapter 14, rose proclaiming victory over death, and that is the most powerful, life-changing story that you and I could ever hear. And the truth is, he didn't come and live and die for you and I to journey through life thinking that this is a book, a tax code, some instruction manual that we need to feel defeated by, but rather he came, as John chapter 1 says, the word became flesh, and he dwelled among us. This is... This is how we know Jesus. This is how we navigate a life of knowing him and following him. It's not a book that tells us we're going to jail or we're going to hell as we've placed our faith in him. It's a book that allows you and I to live a life immersed in Jesus. I thought about this last week. I've been married over 20 years, and I thought maybe what would happen if 20, 21 years ago, I received a book of all of the lessons learned now after 20 years? 
What would that look like? My immediate response is, man, that would save me a lot of issues. But the truth is, if you think about it, it, it really wouldn't be that meaningful, right? The strength in my marriage isn't about me taking in intellectual knowledge and learning facts or even just learning lessons learned, but the strength of my healthy marriage and the love I have for my wife is that I learned those lessons through experience with her. We navigated those together and experience her and I. I failed and we worked through that failure together. She made one mistake maybe over all 20 years, and then we worked through that mistake together, right? That's the experience. That's the journey. That's what makes a marriage relationship. And so you and I, as we look and we hear these words of Jesus, I am the way. That doesn't mean that we go to him because we have a book of facts, and that is how we, we begin to discern what we do or how we live, but rather it means our experience of journeying with him through every single day of our lives is how we know him as the way. So Jesus came and he died to be with you right amidst the struggles that you're in. The marriage difficulties that you're going through right now here today. His invitation to you isn't you have to have that fixed in order to come to me. No, he's saying, I want to be right there with you. The parenting issues that you're struggling with however small or however enormous they might be. He's not saying, come to me when you have those fixed. I'm your destination. No, absolutely not. He's saying, I want to be right in the middle of that struggle with you. I am the way. I am the journey. And so the invitation to you this morning is that wherever you are, if you've never placed your faith in Jesus, when you hear this, and you hear maybe for the first time that it's not about getting everything together, it's not about being perfect enough, it's not about being able to follow this book perfectly, but it's about believing in someone who loved you so much that he died for you, that I invite you to place your faith in him. It's that simple. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you are saved. You are saved. 